Let me start with a disclaimer that I am neither a birder, you know, one of those types that carries binoculars and a telephoto lens camera every time they go outside, nor am I an ornithologist. Some people think that these are the same thing, but they're not. In any case, I am neither one. I know a lot less about birds than I do about mammals, but there are still a few cool evolutionary focused insights I think are worthwhile sharing, especially given the opportunity that a zoo visit affords us. As you might expect from me by now, I'm starting off with a little bit about what we know about the evolutionary history of birds. From the other video, you'll remember that each of the three mammal groups are thought to have begun their respective radiations after the cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Not so with birds. At least two basal splits occurred in the Mesozoic. How do we know this? Well, it's an easy thing to envision. We have a definitive duck fossil from the latest part of the Cretaceous, the Maastrichtian. Now I can imagine a paleontologist making this discovery in the basement of a museum somewhere. There's a brilliant flash of hot adrenaline kicking in as they exclaim, we have duckage in the Mesozoic. Okay, so maybe some of you don't find this as exciting as a paleoornithologist might, but I'm getting to a point here. And that point is that because of this fossil, a legitimate duck from the Cretaceous, we know that the origin of the duck lineage, as well as the lineage that split off before the ducks, they were well established from before the end Cretaceous mass extinction. This is something we don't have for placental mammals. We conclude from this that the birds began their diversification in the Mesozoic, while well, placental mammals didn't appear until the Cenozoic. The other thing this shows us is how labile fossil-based conclusions are. Think about it. If there were no duck fossil, people could still be insisting that birds didn't radiate from the common ancestor until after the start of the Cenozoic, just like the placental mammals and just like the marsupials. One fossil finding made all the difference, pushing back bird origins into the Mesozoic. Could the same thing happen for mammals? Absolutely. If you were to discover a Cretaceous otter, that would basically invalidate many of the conclusions in the paper by O'Leary et al., whose main thrust was that placental mammals took their respective shapes following an origin in the earliest Cenozoic. Want to turn all of mammalian paleontology on its head? One definitive fossil could do it. Now let's look at these basal limbs from the bird tree that are known to have Mesozoic origins. The first one is leading to the Paleognathy, splitting away from the rest of the birds sometime in the Cretaceous. Paleognaths are easy to remember because they're mostly big flightless birds like emus, ostriches, rheas, and cassowaries. But also there in the Paleognathy are the kiwi, which is a small flightless bird from New Zealand, and the tinamu, a small bird that can fly, and it lives in Central and South America. So yeah, these are mostly weird birds. And the first thing many people think is, hey, this group is flightless. Powered flight is a pretty fancy mode of locomotion, and it reeks of being a derived trait. Now, if you follow this line of thought to its logical conclusion, you would probably end up saying that this basal group of flightless birds is telling us that flightlessness was the ancestral trait for birds, and powered flight must have evolved from flightless ancestors along the other lineage, that, the one that gave rise to the rest of birds. And while the logic here has a nice ring to it, it's also totally wrong. First of all, there's the Tinamu, capable of flight and very much a paleognath. So in order for the bird most recent common ancestor to be flightless, the Tinamu would have to have evolved powered flight independently from the rest of the birds. Eh. Secondly, we can see that the lineage of theropods leading to the birds, like this fossil Archaeopteryx, were all winged and capable of powered flight. If paleognaths are flightless today, 
they must have become flightless as a derived character state. Basically, they ditched being able to fly. But flying is so cool. Why would anyone do such a thing? Well, it turns out that flightlessness is actually pretty common in birds that have adapted to life on oceanic islands. The ancestors would have come to the island fully capable of powered flight, but as they settled in and adapted to a world devoid of predators and in which flying around made you actually more susceptible to being blown off the island, flying was at best of no advantage and at worst a real liability to fitness. Another common characteristic of island adapted versions of mainland species is gigantism much larger body size. The general idea here is that on islands, the food supply is more subject to being periodically exhausted. If something similar were to happen on the mainland, the animals could just migrate to a new location. But island animals can't do this. They either die of starvation or they manage to persist until food becomes available again. And large bodies store more resources and can persist through longer periods of starvation. So when you think about it, the two characteristics we associate with the majority of modern paleognaths, gigantism and flightlessness, these are both traits that evolved naturally in response to being isolated on islands. Moreover, they evolved pretty easily, so it's not too hard to imagine the paleognathy having evolved flightlessness and large body size from smaller and flight-capable ancestors. Ancestors would have been kind of like the modern Tinamou. Let's see if I can find any paleognaths at the zoo. I'll bet there's at least an ostrich. So believe it or not, the San Diego Zoo has no ostrich. No emu, no rhea, no paleognaths at all. But I can't let this group go undocumented in this video so I'm dragging out a couple of stills from my last class trip to the safari park where they have cassowaries behind the longhouse structure in their Australian walkabout area. But really, you'd think the zoo would have ostriches, wouldn't you? If I had any foresight, I would have taken at least a still photo of the tinamous at the safari park. But I either didn't actually have that foresight or at least I couldn't find the photo on my phone. I'm glad to have these pics of the cassowary, though. Most of you will already have a general idea of what an ostrich looks like, maybe an emu as well, but cassowaries are definitely more exotic. And apparently deadly. Some guy in Florida was recently murdered by his pet cassowary, kicked and stomped to death by those massive feet. Now turning our attention to the non paleognath birds. The second most basal clade is the Gallo and Seri, the chicken and duck group. Gallo, chicken, answer, duck. Gallo and Seri is the second most basal group of birds, and thanks to that fossil I mentioned earlier, it occurred no later than the Maastrichtian, that is, before the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary 65.5 million years ago. And this origin must have happened later than where the Paleognath split away, right? And this means that there are at least three lineages of modern birds flying around, or in the case of Paleognaths, not flying, by the start of the Cenozoic. So I'm guessing you don't need me to tell you what a duck is, but check out this duck. Pretty cool, huh? Arlequin duck, named after Arlequino, character from Commedia dell'arte, if you know what that is. Uh, you won't find these guys around here, uh, way up north, Alaska, Greenland, Russia. Okay, and the other group, uh, the Gallo part of Gallo and Seri, is for the Galliformes, chickens. And if it looks like a chicken, that's probably what it is. But this group includes also turkeys, quail, grouse, ptarmigans. Now we should clarify something. As a clade, Birds are older than placental mammals, but not the entire class mammalia. Because if you consider when the monotreme, marsupial, and placental mammal lineages split away from their most recent common ancestry, remember this was deeply within the Mesozoic, as in Jurassic or maybe even late Triassic, 
the clade of all mammals is definitely more ancient than that of birds. Later in lecture, we'll be talking about an important life history trait that is shared by the Gallo and Seri and the Palignaths. Chickens and ducks, ostriches and kiwis, all of the birds in these two basal clades, have young that are precocial, meaning that they're well developed at hatching, ready to start feeding on their own without requiring parents that are regurgitating partially digested bugs down into their throats. If you've ever seen a baby chicken, it's a walking, eating, drinking fluff ball within an hour of hatching. This is the case for all members in these two basal clades. The rest of the birds, everything outward on the tree after the ducks, they have young that are altricial, basically requiring a lot more intensive parental assistance. Now here's a good question for you. Of these two character states, precocial young and altricial young, which is more likely ancestral and which is derived, and why? As for the rest of the birds, they're all kind of a mysterious mess to me, I'm afraid. I mean, I can tell you which group any given bird belongs to, but I don't have any good rationale to offer that will help you keep track of the clades, what it is about some groups that makes them more derived, while other groups are more basal. Now with the two most basal clades, of the Palignathi and the Gallo and Seri, we could at least focus on meaningful traits as we thought about the phylogeny reconstruction. Flightlessness evolving as a derived state in the Palignathi, and precocial young being the ancestral character state retained by both of these groups, but not the rest of the birds. The narrative of their evolutionary history based on these characteristics made total sense. It just did. But how can you make sense out of the fact that most birds of prey, like hawks and eagles, are classified together with vultures, while falcons, another prototypical bird of prey, right? Falcons are classified together with parrots, and this makes them more closely related to a sparrow than they are to hawks and eagles. To me, that's kind of crazy. Bird identification seems to be a game involving a lot more memorization and a lot less reasoning. The approach seems to be just see the pretty birdie and then look it up so we can put it into the right taxonomic pigeonhole. Okay, rant over. Let's have a gander at these other birds. The column babies are the doves and the pigeons. Now, as a kid who grew up in the city, Los Angeles, Pigeons were like flying rats, making their nests in the dark corners of buildings, leaving poop all over, and generally taking full advantage of all the great habitat afforded to them by humans. It's kind of a surprise to visit the aviaries of the zoo to find that pigeons and doves are more broadly represented by cousins that are much more varied in size and often very ornate compared with the familiar flying rats of city life. Now, if you ever make it to the safari park, there's a special treat. They have Cory Bustards. This is my favorite pigeon of all. If you know anything about Pokemon, I'm betting that this was the inspiration for Pidgeotto and Pidget. Gigantic pigeons that are legitimate badasses. But I didn't see any at the zoo, though. Too bad. Acorlithornis. Even using Google, I wasn't able to find the etymological origin of this word, but I found many suggestions that it means water and shore birds. I guess lith is stone. That could be shore. And orn could be bird, like ornithology. Equor, however, means level, and so I totally don't get this. In any case, the Acorlithornis includes flamingos, gulls, pelicans, terns, herons, egrets, and penguins. All of them water birds, but not all water birds are in this group. Ducks and geese and swans are obviously water birds of the Gallo and Seri, the basal clade we saw earlier. Also not in this group are the cranes and the rails. 
I've seen tons of these guys at the safari park, but I didn't get any on my trip to the zoo. Everything you're seeing here is in the Acorlithornis, but you really don't need to go to the zoo for them. Okay, so those are white pelicans. Uh, here are some cormorants. And this is a great blue heron. Nasty little beast. First thing I saw getting out of my car today were a couple of gulls sitting on the lights overhead. And no trip to the zoo would be complete without looking at the flamingos. Cool birds, they're filter feeders. They take little shrimp and things out from the water they push through their beaks. And here are the resident penguins, South African penguins, also known as Cape penguins. Uh, my nephew went to Cape Town just so he could visit the penguins. I personally have never been to Africa. Accipitriformes. Well, accipiters are smallish hawks, but their namesake group, the accipitriformes, includes all hawks, vultures, eagles, and even this secretary bird. So the secretary bird is effectively a really large, long-legged, mostly terrestrial eagle with a really cool headdress. I like it anyways. The other bird from this clade that I have for this video is the Batular Eagle from Southern Africa. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. There's one more Exceptriformes. Uh, it's the condor. Uh, this, I think, is a California condor. It might be an Andean condor. They're very similar. Both very large vultures. Uh, California condor, at least, is uh, extremely uh, threatened. Um, hunted to nearly extinction. As I mentioned before, Falcons, which are ecologically similar to exhibitors, are not in this group. They stand out because of their surprising absence from this clade of birds. Coraciliformes is the group of birds including the toucans, trogons, hornbills, and kingfishers. Okay guys, I had some pretty good footage of toucans here, but I can't seem to find it. I uh, must have lost it from my phone. Uh, this is a laughing kookaburra. You can't see it terribly well, but it's a classic kingfisher. It's a little bit larger than most of the kingfishers that you'll find in North America. But uh, kingfishers are just like really awesome birds. And I was also expecting to see hornbills. Like Zezu, they're at the safari park, but I didn't see any on my trip to the zoo. Passeriformes, sometimes called perching birds, even though I'm pretty sure that all birds perch. This is the largest and most diverse group of birds. It includes all the little sparrow-like things. Passer is the genus of a house sparrow, which is actually not a sparrow, it's a weaver finch. As well as big sparrow-like things like ravens and all the sparrow-like things in between. As a non-birder, I find it endlessly amusing how bird watchers obsess over identifying these things. To me, they're all sparrows. Okay, I can just hear my bird watcher friends saying, Blasphemy! How could you say such a thing? For example, they would be rapturous about these white-fronted bee-eaters. White-fronted? I don't see any whites on the front, but that's what they are. Okay, um, Bee-eaters are interesting for other reasons. For example, this is a, a, a group, a guild of uh, birds that are extremely diverse on the archipelago of Hawaii. That's interesting. Oh, and look at this sparrow. It's actually an Andean cock of the rock. Uh, bright orange color tells you what about its life history. Maybe sexual selection? Okay, and oh, I knew they were here, okay? So here are the toucans that I was talking to you about before. Uh, toucans are really evil birds. They, uh, they're, they're pretty, but they eat the babies and eggs of other kinds of birds, especially parrots. Okay. Um, bird of paradise. Uh, we talked about the male bird of paradise as being a classic female choice-driven morphology uh, early in the semester. And finally, um, this is an oropendula, 
another sparrow that makes a very particular kind of nest. Uh, this one is, it looks like it's in the process of being torn apart, but it's a hanging nest. Oropendulas are closely related to orioles, who also form hanging nests. So that's it for the birds. Now, while I was at the zoo, I took some extra photos and videos of herps. That's biologists speak for amphibians and reptiles. And I figured I might as well share them with you here just for fun. We talked about herps in a previous lecture unit, but here's a little slideshow anyways. Starting with amphibians, then squamates, then turtles, both types, cryptodeers and pleurodeers and then a crocodile. Enjoy. So obviously we're looking at frogs. We uh, call frogs by the other name, the anura, which literally means no tail. Okay. And the other group of amphibians, the other main group of amphibians that do have tails are the salamanders, and they get the name caudata, which literally means tailed animals. Okay. And now we're going to be moving into the reptilomorphs, uh, lepidosaurs are the most basal of the reptilomorphs, and these are obviously lizards. Okay. Now, when it comes to lizards, uh, we usually try to identify lizards based on general appearance. Uh, for example, some lizards kind of looking like this are skinks. Uh, lizards that have an iguana-like appearance are usually iguanas. Um, monitor lizards have a very characteristic appearance. and um, can't tell what this one is. Um, it's been a while. Uh, I would say it's either an anguid or a teid, although my lizard taxonomy has not been uh, kept up very re well recently. But I'm trying. Okay, so uh, snakes also in the squamata, the most basal group of snakes, the most basal groups of snakes are the pythons, like this guy here, and the boas. Okay, um, well, this is a rosy boa, uh, California native find him in the deserts locally. Okay, boas and pythons have uh, actually vestiges of their hind limbs. Uh, none of the other snakes show any signs that they ever had uh, four limbs. And yet they are tetrapods, right? They're part of the tetrapodomorpha. Um, the rest of the snakes are kind of broken into three main categories. Uh, one of the categories are the viperids and uh, vipers tend to have triangular shaped heads and fangs in the front of their mouth. Okay, um, front fang snakes. Uh, this is a Bushmaster, big evil snake from South America and uh, Central America. Another group of very dangerous snakes, but these guys have their fangs in the rear of their mouth, are the elapids, which includes cobras, um, coral snakes, um, green mambas like this guy, and, uh, and a few others, crates, I think I mentioned them. Um, and the last group of snakes are the colubrids, the uh, typical non-venomous snakes that we find most of the time in Southern California. With the exception of an occasional rattlesnake, most of the snakes that you come across will be in the colubridae. Now there are a few colubrids that do have venom. The boom slang is one, venomous colubrid. Uh, this guy, Oxybelus, the vine snake, is another venomous colubrid, although the vine snake has really short rear, rear fangs. Probably not going to hurt you, even if it does bite you. All right, now moving further out on the Reptilomorpha part of our tree. Uh, now we're in the Chelonia. Uh, Chelonia may be as maybe actually be legitimate archosaurs, or maybe they're uh, branching off from before the archosaurs. Uh, these are all pleurodeers, or this is our second pleurodeer, long snake-necked or side-necked turtles. They uh, don't ever pull their necks or their heads fully into their shell, uh, whereas the cryptodeers, like this guy, does pull the head, head all the way back in. Um, this is another cryptodeer. Uh, most of the turtles we find in North America, all the turtles we find in North America, are cryptodeers. Okay. Um, this is obviously a tortoise, Galapagos tortoise. Um, this guy is actually sped up. I sped the video up quite a bit. If you want to see it even faster, here we go. And uh, now we get to the crocodile, a legitimate archosaur. 
sister taxon to the birds in this sort of a way. I mean, apart from the rest of the dinosaurs, Crocodilla marfa would be sister taxa with birds right there in the Archosauria. All right, that's it.